I'm going to touch on sharpening. Um, I say touch on because sharpening is a big topic um, and I, I can only really relatively show you how to do it in a, a rudimentary fashion but it will get an edge on what you're using and it should be a decent edge and it won't wreck your blade um, as I've said don't do this on expensive knives because or, or swords because you'll potentially ruin them you need to get to a point where you're confident that what you're doing is going to end up with an edge that you're happy with um, so this is weasel you right, Wiz? Um, so blade geometry wise we've got three different types we've got your standard hollow grind um, which is used on pen knives a lot of the time because stock removal is easy um, if you've got the appropriate you know tool to do it you can just hollow grind brilliant um, it also removes the most amount of metal very uh, the fastest before it comes to the cutting edge that's another good reason why it's, it's been used for well, a long time then you've got your apple seed or convex or with niku style blade and as, as you can imagine that actually adds metal to the edge before it comes down to the sharp point and that means that it can take a lot of percussive damage um, well a lot of being hit fast against things um, then you've got your no niku flat grind or sometimes called scandy grind and that removes the amount of metal you need to get to the edge as quickly as possible um, you see this in Scandinavian Mora type knives you see it in Wakazashi and Tanto the specialized Goza cutters they've either got very little niku or no niku at all um, brilliant for that sort of thing but as you can imagine at the sacrifice of strength because you've removed some of the metal regardless of what people say when you remove metal from a blade it doesn't in any way make it stronger the idea of the blood groove making something stronger because the blood groove because metal has been removed is ridiculous um, but there you go I've got just for your viewing pleasure um, Balasong this is a hollow ground because it is essentially a pen knife blade um, and right at the edge you've got a 20 degree on either side um, and that's you know it's exactly the same as any other cheap knife I'm not saying that all secondary bevel hollow ground knives are cheap I'm just saying that when you pick up a cheap knife chances are it's going to be that way and of course the stereotypical although this one's got a lock a Swiss Army knife, um, exactly the same again. Then for your flat grind, this one used to be the well, it still is. It's the tip of a katana that I have. Well, I, I particularly like, so I built a little handle for it, and off you go. But that that hasn't got any niku pretty much now. It just comes down from the shinobi to the cutting surface. And then you have swords with Niku like this one. This is a cheap 1045 um, beta, as it were. It's in rough polish. You more than likely cannot see it from here. But it does have a fair amount of Niku, and that's not because they tried to build it traditionally. It's because 1045 is a steel that likes to bend. Uh, it doesn't flex back, you, you know if you use one of these swords for long enough you'll find that it will be all kind of wiggly where you try to bend it back to straight but not quite managed it this is the one that we're going to be sharpening or, or polishing same thing really uh, because it's 1045 it's soft steel I can get a an okay polish on this in less time than I could on say like a hardened 1060 or 1095 and Bearing in mind I'm doing it on video, that makes sense. It gets us swifter results. This is one that I was working on. I don't know whether or not the camera's going to pick this up, but um, 
this is on one side a foundation polish as it were it's it's rough it's not reflective it's horrible um, but it's a basis to start with and on the other side don't know whether or not you can see any of this I had to find out afterwards um, I've taken that to a thousand grit uh, carefully so it's should be a lot more reflective um, traditionally cut and I weren't um, weren't sharpened in this or weren't polished rather in this fashion but this is a functional blade I mean I may actually acid etch it afterwards I was kind of hoping that if I polished it far enough the differential heat treatment would show but it's a Hanway practical katana probably like one of the early generations I'm not even convinced they clay those blades I think they sort of soften the spine of the blade um, after hardening but I could be wrong uh, but no amount of polishing it seems is going to bring that out but okay that's that's where we are that's where we are for blade types I'm going to um, show you two different mediums. Um, one is sandpaper and the other one is a polishing stone. And we'll um, see whether or not we can't put a decent edge or a decent-ish edge on that 1045 and then watch it fall off after it's used for 10 minutes. Hey. Right, always have a cup of tea. Yep. When sharpening, you're gonna have to shift that off because the table will shake around. You'll end up with tea all over the place. It's a whole palaver. But what the blade we're going to be sharpening, like I said, is going to be this one um, because it's soft steel um, and it, it needs a polish anyway. I mean, it's not a blade I'm going to be using a lot, so I, I may as well make it look pretty. It's a pity about the uh, Sukumaki, but maybe I'll fix that at some point when I've got enough pennies to do so. Now there are two mediums that you can use for sharpening. Um, one is wet and dry sandpaper which is a cheaper way. You'll go through a lot of it but it's it's cheaper. Um, it's just not as good. Uh, you'll need something that's pretty much perfect flat. Now a tile is flattish. It's flat enough. It's not perfect. If you can get um, you know like a plate of thick glass that would be fantastic do not use thin glass because the, the surface underneath is not going to be perfectly flat you'll push down on it you'll break it you'll end up with blood tears hospital visits you know all those things you hate but a tile it's it's good enough um, and you'll need some wet and dry obviously not little bits like this this is what I use for polishing out troublesome little bits on blades um, what you need is a sheet now I'm not entirely sure that I have a sheet. I've got a large enough piece that'll do. Um, you may well need to just bring it as close to being neat as possible. It's not fantastic. But there you go. will hate me for cutting through this stuff but I'll just put another edge on it at some point it's no biggie there we go brilliant that's neat enough for this purpose now you need to stick it to this the best stuff I've found for me because it's easy is put that cup there is this carpet adhesive I know don't hate me just spray it on the back like this doesn't really matter, it goes all goopy. Lay it on here. It'll fizz. Take a book. Pop it down. Try and cover as much of it, if not all of it, as possible. And then you leave it. Leave it to dry. You need it as flat as possible. I'll pop it over here. Check on that later. And that is, that's an okay sharpening surface, um, especially for smaller, smaller blades, because you will get through the wet and dry. Um, it's just one of those things. And if you're going to be taking your blade off and checking it, you know, wiping it clean, then you're going to be wiping away some of the 
some of the grit that they glue to the paper on a stone you've got plenty of that the stone's made of it but you know wet and dry it's it just comes off and it vanishes and you end up with a piece of paper it's a bit rubbish now if you've got a, a wet stone or a water stone you're going to need to soak it I've been I've basically stored my stone in this um, I've just got a little little stand there which is supposed to not slide around but that's lies it does um, so after soaking your stone for about half an hour pop it there you can see this one's well used unfortunately it has a massive concave there so I try and sharpen up one end or the other where it is relatively flat um, you can get other stones which allow you to flatten this out but I found that with uh, blades with Niku this is weirdly enough kind of helpful like I said it's got rubber feet that help it stick um, but that's lies so if I wet a cloth this used to be one of my favorite tops I've had it for about 10 years now um, so it has been retired at last I like purple. Right, <clears throat> there we go. Oh, hello, Mr. Spider. I didn't see you there. Come on. Off you get. There you go, sweetie. Down there. <clears throat> right. Um, so this is the blade we're going to be sharpening. And we're going to work on one side. Okay, we're going to work on this side here. Um, no point doing both sides at the moment. Um, if you put your blade on the surface you'll be able to see this one is, is brilliant because it exaggerates this fact and it's something that I didn't touch on in the article is sharpening a blade with Niku um, it won't lay flat yeah um, you won't be able to see this but if I pop it down like that and then I rock it forward there's a definite you can see it down this end there's a definite amount of rotation there and that's because of that apple seed bevel which means that we won't just be sliding the sword backwards and forwards we will be starting on the edge and then rotating it like that don't rotate the other way because if you go too far here you'll round your shinogi that's a bummer if you go too far this way you'll end up with a blunt blade which is rubbish okay so you need to keep the stone wet at all times not soaking but, but wet because otherwise you know you'll put huge scratches along the blade and it'll be rubbish right we won't be polishing um, or we won't be doing the Yukote uh, on cheap blades like this anyway it's not normally poorly done and it's going to take a lot of you know punishment so I don't bother now to start with I'm going to ignore this bit and we'll touch on that later but starting on the starting on the um, right on the cutting edge keep your fingers up here you move the blade forward in this motion and as you do so you just slightly turn it to round it or to roll it back towards the shinogi just keeping the strokes short or you know shortish the distance you feel comfortable with and consistent or as consistent as you can manage if you're blessed with a uh, with a stone, a water stone like I am because of my fantastic brother who sent me one. These things are amazing. Then you can just, it's, you can wipe this down as much as you like really. And you can see the, uh, the pattern on the blade that you're creating as you're doing this. And the idea is to get all the scratches because you can see it, especially in this light, gorgeous morning you can see all the scratches and you need to get them to look the same along the blade it is especially with a hardened blade it's going to be a lot harder to to do this I mean not a lot harder it's just going to take more time um, not only is this blade you know 1045 I, I think they messed up the the heat treatment as well because it really is rather bendy there you go this blade came with a secondary bevel like a pen knife so obviously quality wasn't wasn't on their minds because we're doing this we're also missing this point here as we roll it so what I'm going to do is 
just take that into consideration. Same motion, but obviously paying more attention to the area just underneath the shinogi. Let's turn the blade over and check it. There we go. Because this is a thousand grit and because we're just starting, we can definitely see all the marks here. But don't worry, just keep at it. We're looking for consistency. To start with, it's going to look like a big old mess. As long as it looks like a consistent mess, then you're all right. I'm going to cut all this bit out now. Or maybe I'll fast forward it. I really don't know. There is, uh, there is a little mantra, as it were, that says, although I'm pretty sure it says it in more poetic language, it says 100 strokes before moving on to the next part of the blade. It seems to work. I'm going to ignore it <laughs> because I'm doing video and I'm not actually looking for a, an amazing edge on this. Maybe I'll spend some time on it at some point. But Cats are frisky this morning. Squirrel, do not go over there and make things worse. When you're doing the tip of the sword, as you work your way up, it's the same sort of motion, but obviously you're going to be concentrating on getting the same sort of appearance that you've been working on uh, for the main body of the sword. When you roll the sword back, when you roll it back, make sure you're not gouging huge chunks out of your stone with the tip. Same thing applies to wet and dry, only obviously the wet and dry will tear and you'll notice it. It's more difficult to notice if you're not aware of it on a water stone. Um, there'll be chunks are taken out the top of it and you, then you'll have to use like the back of a knife or something like that to try and flatten it out. You'll waste a lot of stone and it's a pain in the bum. So just bear that in mind. Right, now I'm not going to do the entire blade because, you know, video and all that. Right, this stroke was done like this. So if you imagine on this side of the blade, the, uh, the scratches you're making are in this direction. What we need is now is to make scratches in this direction. So the motion changes and it becomes that. We're trying to remove the scratches that we've, we've done previously and replace them with scratches in this direction. Cunning, huh? Not only does this remove the previous scratches, it also helps to remove the most metal if you imagine, well not like we're trying to gouge bits out, but if you imagine um, after a while of doing scratches in one direction, a lot of the abrasive is going to be going down the same channels that you've cut into the metal before. So this, this helps to remove that problem. You'll find that the amount of pressure you put on the blade as well will affect the finish. Every stone's different, every person's different, but take that into consideration when you're doing this. If you find that you're gouging um, horrible tracks, maybe it's not your stone, maybe you're putting too much or too little pressure. Just, you know, experiment a little on the first on the first run through. I've on my other blade I have gone back through this exact process a couple of times using the same grit purely because it, if you get the foundation for one of these stones down then when you step up and maybe you know on the other side of this is a 3000 grit when you step up like that you haven't got anything any scratches that you didn't remove that are going to be you know you're going to find a problem. 
if the scratches on a blade are too deep then no amount really no appreciable amount of going at it with a high grit stone is going to remove those you need to work up to the high grit stones Finally, what we're going to do is to remove those ones with longitudinal scratches. The, the scratches running the length of the blade are going to be the ones that make it shine, okay, because it's just the way it is. If you have scratches going along here, it allows the light to travel. If they're all in one of these directions, um, then not so much. So. This isn't the finish. I mean, really, I could, you know, to a certain amount, I could skip this step, but I never do. Um, but if it is the finishing, if it is the finishing grit, then this is going to be the one that makes all the hard work actually jump out at you. Now, like I said, take your time. No need to rush it even though I am for this video, so there's only so much that I want to fast forward. You'll get the idea. Look at the edge, because this is a thousand. We're still removing a fair amount of metal on a, on a soft blade. You can see the edge damage which on this blade is quite significant really only if you look carefully but you know um, because I'm not going to be sharpening this side I'm not going to worry about taking it out because I don't want to sharpen it overly on one side because I'll ruin what little geometry this has but it's a good good time to look at that and carefully if needs be just touch it up a little bit Pushing on the ha here, rolling the blade forward. Alrighty. And that's that's what I would expect it to look like. There's a little bit here, a little darker patch, which normally means <coughs> that it's not as finely done as the rest of the uh, blade and it picks up the dirt from the stone and it holds on to it so that's that's something as well pay attention to that it, when you wipe the blade clean any weird patches along it are normally a result of uneven polishing right now we're going to turn this over and this is a 3000 grit how you jump up through the stones is entirely up to you. Um, oh yeah, give it a wipe clean as well because otherwise you'll have 1000 grit gunk all over your 3000 grit stone. <clears throat> yeah, how you jump up through the stones is up to you. Um, I found this was absolutely fine. Uh, like I said, I'm, I, don't, I don't do this because I've been taught. Uh, it was kind of experimental, so when I say it works fine, people who do this for a living could probably shoot me or something but I found that it works fine and we use the same the same motion just on the high grit stone we make our little X pattern in the steel polish the same amount the same sort of stroke oh, that's a good point actually um, you should remove the blade when doing this um, I can't on this one because they've glued it into the uh, into the suka. But there you go. For this purpose, this is absolutely fine. But it should be noted if you can remove the blade, fantastic. Because when you get down to the habaki, you're going to find you're either scraping the habaki or right at the edge, you're going to have an unpolished bit. Especially with these motions, you can only go so far. So this little triangular bit here, yeah, doesn't get touched. Wet and dry sandpaper will probably help you there because you can get into it, but...
Okay, sorry about that. Um, camera battery died. You know how it is. Right, I've been working on this rather quickly to be honest for a little while. Um, but you can tell, hopefully, from this side, this was a foundation polish to a halfway decent reflective surface. Um, I think you probably notice very little uh, difference in, in your cutting, but I don't know, maybe on mats it, it matters more. Um, obviously, I can carry on to this, sorry, with this until it became amazing, um, and I probably will at some point. But for the purpose of this video, you get the idea. Um, remember with Niku, the rocking motion, I suppose the other alternative is just to do it at one angle, then tilt the blade slightly, and but you run the risk of missing patches, so a rocking motion is your best bet. Um, I'm not entirely sure whether or not this is now paper cutting sharp, but it bloody well feels it. Um, it won't stay that sharp, obviously, because it's a soft metal, but that that shows that you can get a really kick-ass edge on a blade with a fair amount of Niku. Um, so bear that in mind as well. Although a you know a, well a a blade with no Niku will end up sharper, it not amazingly so. But yeah, I hope uh, more than anything just seeing the, the the sharpening process has given you an idea of what you're what you're going to be doing when you attempt it yourself. Uh, let me know. Comment at the bottom. You know. Blah blah blah. Thanks for watching.